About the 20th of May, 1859, preparations were completed for a grand campaign against the Indians, who occupied the country near the headwaters of the Red South Canadian, North Canadian, Red Fork, Arkansas, and Cimarron Rivers. The invading forces to consist of regulars, rangers, and friendly Indians. And upon the rangers devolved the duty of scouring the Great Salt Plain, or desert, which disfigures so large a portion of the American map and upon which the unlucky traveler or soldier is required to endure almost every extreme of heat, hunger, and thirst. As there is no protection from the scorching rays of the sun, no means of procuring food, and few fountains of fresh water. While on this expedition, I was sent out on one occasion with a party of friendly Indians, about thirty in number, under charge of Casa Maria, a famous Caddo warrior and chief, to the headwaters of the false Washita, and thence northwest, across the divide, between that stream and the Canadian, with a view to reconnoitering and ascertaining if any of the enemy were lurking in the vicinity. We were riding along in regular Indian style, with flankers at every side, and a small guard far in the advance, when suddenly the latter wheeled their horses and waved a scarf or handkerchief, as a token that we were in the presence of danger. And in an instant, flankers and skirmishers came in upon us at a run, while we of the main body halted to ascertain particulars. The advance guard, on arriving, reported that they had discovered a village of at least a hundred lodges in the distance, and from all appearances, they felt convinced that we were in the neighborhood of a superior force. Casa Maria, not content to hear the report, repaired at once to the spot to view the scene for himself. But before starting, he required his interpreter to ask me if I desired to see our common enemy for myself in their houses. I replied in the affirmative, when he turned to his own men, and pointing back to the agency, addressed them in Caddo. And though I did not understand his language, I judged its tenor, from the fact that the whole party turned for home, on anything else than a snail's gallop. They looked a little disappointed, but the word of the chief was law to them. It was his province to command, theirs to obey. When they had departed, the doughty chief, pistol in hand, made a sign for me to follow him, which I did with eagerness. He led the way, at a charge, riding over the ridge and down to the village, at full speed. On, we rode. He appeared determined to storm the village alone. The astounded denizens of the lodges were unprepared for the spectacle, and not understanding the character of their visitors, were stupid with wonder, and gazed in amazement on us as we almost flew toward them. Riding to a point so near that we could distinguish their features, and they ours, a sudden movement convinced us that they now knew us as we were, hostile warriors. The men at once sprang to their arms and horses, but before they could mount, we wheeled in a long, sweeping circle, at the same time discharging our pistols among them, and then left them, greeting them with a long and loud yell of exultation and the well-known war whoop of the Caddo. As we gained the top of the ridge, in another direction from that in which we first made our appearance, and about two miles from the village, we cast a glance rearward to ascertain what they were doing. We could distinctly see the warriors mounting in hot haste their steeds, and the squaws and boys running to and fro with accoutrements, suitable for immediate chase, everything being in the highest state of excitement. I now wondered what adventures would next fall to our lot when the chief dismounted, tightened his girth, and motioned me to do likewise, which I did. Without exhibiting the least excitement, the chief stood his ground, till he saw the Comanches all mounted. Then yelling at the top of his voice, Wita, Wita, por los Mugers. And giving his pursuers a parting war whoop, he struck out in an entirely different direction from that taken by his men. On we flew, across the prairie, till we reached a ridge, which we crossed, after which we turned our course, and ran down a creek in the course taken by his men, and after flying at half speed, for about two hours, we reached a creek which emptied into the Washita, when we slackened our horses to a walk for ten or fifteen minutes, after which we again started off at full gallop to a point near the mouth of the creek, 
where we came upon our late comrades, halted and ready for a fight. Casa Maria at once deployed his men under cover, after which he sent his horses down into the bed of the stream, at the same time motioning me to go with the horse guard. I shook my head when he called his interpreter, who informed me that he wanted me to keep at a safe distance so that I would receive no injury, as he wanted me to ride quick and tell the white men what I had seen. I told him that I would not go to the rear like a woman, but would bear my part in the impending battle, and that if I was killed, the other white men could do as I had done, come and see for themselves. He then beckoned me to approach him and told his interpreter to inform me that he desired I should keep by his side. We were all well concealed, behind bushes, rocks, and trees, lying down as closely to the ground as possible, to await the unsuspecting Comanches, who believed that they had but two men to contend with. Nor did we lie long idle. Soon the enemy, some forty in number, came scouring in at full speed, closely following the trail we had made, as if by instinct. On they came, till they arrived within rifle range, when Casa Maria drew from his pouch a whistle made from the thigh bone of an eagle and blew one long, low note, which was followed up by three short, quick, piercing ones. And instantly a volley from Caddo rifles greeted the flank of the overconfident and unsuspecting Comanches, who broke in every direction, some flying from the field not to return again. A portion of the savages, however, more resolute than the remainder, soon rallied, and seemed determined to hold us, till reinforcements arrived from the village, and they at once commenced a rapid and well-directed fire. But they fought at a disadvantage, as we were thoroughly protected by our position, while they were compelled to stand out upon the open ground. They did not dismount, as is usual, but each warrior rode up within range, discharged his piece, and galloped off to a place of safety, where he reloaded and returned to discharge it again. A word of command from our chief almost instantly changed the whole aspect of the struggle. The men, on hearing it, bounded from their places of concealment, and with guns, pistols, bows, and lances, charged out upon the mounted Comanches. Arrows flew thick and fast for a brief interval, and rapidly we were nearing the foe, and a hand-to-hand -hand encounter seemed imminent. But before our band had reached the spot where our enemies stood, they wheeled their animals and fled from the field, utterly foiled and beaten. Once masters of the field, the whistle of the Caddo chief was heard again, and instantly his men commenced disposing of the fallen Comanches. There were on the ground seven killed and nine wounded, and the dispatching of the latter was at once commenced. All were slain, and their scalps added to the trophies of the victory. Some of the wounded struggled fiercely with lance and bow, but all were either shot or tomahawked by the infuriated but exulting Caddo's. Some yielded up their lives with stoical firmness, chanting their own death song, though suffering the most intense agony until the Caddo's would leap upon them and, with a blow of the tomahawk, end their torture in a bloody death. Others begged piteously that their lives might be spared, but there was no mercy in the breast of the victor for the foe, though fallen and helpless. As long as the fight lasted, I could shoot and yell with the best of them. But the struggle over and the success complete, my heart sank within me, and I sickened at the bloody work in which my comrades appeared to take so great a delight. But there was no escape for me. I must stand by and witness it all, without a murmur or a remonstrance. To have interposed an objection, would but have added to the magnitude of the tortures inflicted, and perhaps brought down upon my own head the vengeance of Casa Maria and his men. That I might at least turn away from the scene, I mounted my horse and rode a short distance, as if looking out for Comanches, till the work of slaughter had ended. Scalping, barbarous as it is, is reduced to an art among the Indians. The victor cuts a clean circle around the top of the head, so that the crown may form the center and the diameter of the scalp exceeds six inches. Then, winding his fingers in the hair, he puts one foot on the neck of the prostrate foe, and with a vigorous pull, tears the reeking scalp from the skull. To the dead, this, of course, would not be absolute cruelty, but it is too frequently the case that the process is performed and the scalp severed while yet the mangled victim lives. And there are instances where parties have recovered and long survived this barbarous mutilation. Occasionally, a warrior is not satisfied with the part of the scalp usually taken, 
but bears the skull entirely, and carries away in triumph even the ears of his victim. The scalping concluded, and the trophies gathered up and secured. Another shrill whistle brought the victors into their saddles, and we began a precipitate retreat to our own village. For several miles we marched in solid column, but an order from the chief scattered the crowd, and every man took the direction which best suited his fancy. I was now once more alone with the chief. Dismounting, we suffered our wearied steeds to rest and graze for some time, keeping a sharp lookout, the while, to prevent surprise. After the last of his men had disappeared, the chief mounted his horse, at the same time pointing in the direction of the Comanche camp. It was now evident that our enemies had been reinforced, and were returning to the pursuit. A light gray column of dust was rising, the cause of which we were at no loss to cipher. We must hasten away, or our scalps might soon grace the lodge of the Comanche, as a compensation for the losses they had that day sustained. James Pike. Hey.